today there are three people. I will only give like a little bit of like introduction and then I will hand over to you from Kaspar. So we are going to talk today about bringing graphical applications to Nero and uh, with an example in this case on how we do that with React Native. And um, we will, I will start a little bit about like Eclipse on Nero, a bit of an overview in history, so I'm not sure who's aware of that or not. I will briefly go through that. And then I will talk a little bit about like Open Harmony and the graphical um, system we're having with RQHI that's already existing. And then from there I will hand over to Julius and Kasper and then they will do a very deep dive into React Native and then how they actually do that going into on Nero. So let's get started here. So Eclipse on Nero, it's a on your working group. It's a working group here at Eclipse Foundation, and the basic slogan, the basic idea, is that it's an oper open source operating system platform for all content devices, connecting them devices big and small. What we mean by that is that first of all, we have a platform that means we have like working on all kind of different hardware types. We are trying to connect these things together. So far, the the consumer in there in the slogan is meant that we have been working very much on consumer electronics most of the time. This is shifting a little bit, so there's more industrial and automotive interest in the group, so that might change over time. And the devices big and small basically means that the platform we are building is not only capable of running on application uh, of on CPU systems with like a big ARM CPU or an Intel CPU or something, but also on small microcontroller systems. So we have different kernels for that. On the on the big system side, we obviously have Linux and on the small system side we um, we experimented a little bit with Zephyr but we also have LightOS as an outro system that can be used and then run Open Harmony and, and Eclipse on top of it. So about the history. So we, we started the working group formally in 2021. Um, that was like a uh, virtual EclipseCon at that point. We launched it there. We did uh, in 2021, we also did the first release, and in 2022, we did an Onero 2.0 release. And the focus was very much on a horizontal platform to like really have a good southbound support to all kind of hardware, to cater all kind of needs that are um, we can use for the different use cases the uh, on your platform could be used for. So some of the things we selected at that point have been Yocto as a build system, Linux obviously as a kernel, Zephyr as an Arto system. We built from ground up an IP2 chain. Um, we set up rules and guidelines and all the policies for maintenance for over the air updates, we worked on blueprints. This basically means like bringing like, proof of concepts to a specific level that partners can take on. And we took Open Harmony, I will come to that later again, um, and took that from, from China and took all the different components in Open Harmony and tried to integrate that with Onir in the Yocto build. In 2023, so this year, we changed a little bit of the, the strategy of the focus of the group. So we have been embracing Open Harmony a lot more. So instead of doing our own build system with Yocto, we embraced using Open Harmony directly and only doing a particular enhancement on the system to building a full vertical solution instead of aiming just for a horizontal approach. So in one of these uh, enhancements we have been doing is towards rich graphics uh, support uh, for applications as well as ecosystem and so on. This is basically the segue going over to, um, to the graphical part, Open Harmony and the ArcUI, where we have, um, where we can see Open Harmony is a project that is developed on Giti at the Open Atten Foundation in China. Um, they have different system types, basically standard, small, and light. So you have standard, which is run in Linux. Small could be an Arthos or it could be Linux. And light is always an Arthos system. So there you can see there's a multi-kernel approach for that. It has quite a few distributed capabilities for distributed data management, for like scheduling and so on. So basically you can form um, a network of devices within your home or in an industry, in, in a factory or something like that, and they would share computing resources and all these kind of things. Um, so what we're doing right now, if you listen in and you're wondering right, what is the difference between Open Harmony and Onero and all these kind of things. So basically the Eclipse Onero project is the sister project of Open Harmony and we try to bring all the all the resources over to Europe basically to work on it. So what we did over the last couple of weeks have been to do a full mirror of all the Open Harmony um, repositories and everything, bring that over to GitHub in an Eclipse Foundation um, organization. So we can build it now here and everything, so we don't need to wait to get all the data from China and have like a way of like contributing back here as well. 
Um, and one of these things to contribute back is actually the React Native support um, Yuris and Casper will talk about. So in terms of the graphical pipeline, the graphical framework we are having in place in Open Harmony already, so this is RQI. Um, it's, a, it's a default um, development framework for Open Harmony. It has kind of native performance thanks to the Arc language and the compiler runtime. This is that would be a completely separate talk, right? Um, what Arc is and what, what it really does. Um, but basically, RQI supports two different types of workflows for developers. So one would be the, the web-like workflow, the web-like development paradigm you might know with JavaScript and all these things. And then there's the declar declarative development paradigm, which also is supported by RQI. And basically, that means you have two types here. We have ArcTS, this is Arc TypeScript, and ArcJS for Arc JavaScript. And as you can see here, they have like different approaches what they, for what kind of needs they are catering, right? One is for like a web developer that comes and wants to do an application. It's a smaller team, basically, and it's a, it's a kind of a simple application. In this case, ArcJS is like a good, good target point and where we would just get started if you have JavaScript and CSS experience and so on. If you want to go and have like a bigger team want to do a really big application with all kind of back-end infrastructure and so on, like really a lot of communication going back and forth, and you need more support there, then something like RTS might be interesting for you. It's uh, had a better performance. It has a, it's a superset with so, um, um, enhanced TS is like a superset of the TypeScript um, language. It has uh, type checking as compile time, and it, the target is really like complex applications and normally working in a bigger team to distribute um, the workload on, on different people, basically. As I said, this is just an, in a nutshell what's going on on the Open Harmony and on Euro side. And with that, I will go over to um, to Kasper here to go a bit more into React Native. Yeah, hi, my name is Kasper, and I'm working in software mention, as you can probably tell by now. Um, and I'm gonna tell you, I have a couple of words about React Native. Uh, React Native is a cross-platform JavaScript framework for building UI applications. You can use it to, tr to create truly native applications that run on both on iOS, Android, but also Windows, Mac OS, web, and also, well, on Euro. Use uh, React to build applications from a single code base. And what is React? React is the most popular JavaScript library for building uh, web applications, interactive web applications. To the clue of it, it's really, really simple, really. So when using React, you kind of build your interactive web applications from blocks. And we call these blocks uh, components. And components are just JavaScript functions. You can pass to these JavaScript functions some data. Uh, we call that passing data by props. Uh, these components can have their interactive states, and they re-render, they recreate the components um, based on that state. And from that components, you can also return, well, HTML. Uh, it's a different syntax, it's JSX, but that, that means returning HTML from JavaScript files, and that's very, very it. That's the clue of React. And we use React to build web applications, but like desktop applications or mobile applications aren't browsers. There are some other tools that um, tell us otherwise. For example, there is um, Ionic, which with Ionic, you create a website that looks like a mobile application or a desktop application, and you wrap it with a web view. A web view is a simplified web browser, nothing more. On the other hand, there is Flutter, which paints the uh, interface on a canvas pixel by pixel. It's imitating an application, but works more of a, like a game engine approach. You are, you are painting pixels rather than using uh, native features. And we have, well, React Native. And in React Native, it works differently from these two. In React Native, when you have a text component that in the end, it renders on each platform, for example, iOS on Android, um, the true native view, like the true UI text view, for example, on iOS. And on the left-hand side, you can see a screenshot from Xcode, which is a tool for building iOS applications. And that's a native view hierarchy of an application. You can see, yeah, that's a true application. There is no imitation, there is no canvas. This is a real application. And on the right-hand side, you have Android Studio, and uh, screenshot from Layout Inspector, the same thing. 
one application, like one code base, but we have two applications that do the same thing, but works well on the two other platforms respectively. We don't have HTML tags in React Native, so we don't have divs or paragraphs. Instead, we have like native components. So for example, here, div is now a view component, paragraph is a text, and so on. There aren't so many of these components, but just enough to build um, apps with it. So you don't have to memorize that many. If you know HTML, you can probably uh, like get to what, what, what will work in React Native by, yeah, this is input, this is text input in React Native, simple. And if you compare React Native uh, to React, it's, well, exactly the same, because it is React in the end. But you are not using HTML tags, you are just using these native components from React Native. So you have view, text, buttons. Yeah, it's very, very similar. You have the state, you have the props. If you, have, if you like, it works the same as React. And it is like that because React Native has its motto, learn once, write anywhere. It's different from uh, Java's motto, um, write once, run anywhere. No, you're learning once because platforms differ from each other. And you have some, sometimes you have to do like if checks. If you're running on Onira, for example, the app may look or behave a bit differently. But in the end, you use the knowledge once to build on various platforms. So I've prepared a demo that runs on um, three platforms simultaneously from one code base. And get the video. OK, so think about it. We have uh, iOS, Android, and the web running from a single code base. If you have to do this three times, build one on iOS using Swift or Objective-C, build one for Android using Kotlin or Java, and on the web, well, HTML and JavaScript, you have to build it three times and know these uh, technologies and then maintain these technologies separately. It's when building just once from single code base, when it works the same, it looks the same, it's a very, very cost-effective way of building applications. Yeah, and it works the same on web as well. OK, next. So it took me around 600 lines of code. That's nothing. And that's like in just one, uh, one language. Doing it on Android separately, iOS separately, I'll have to learn many different technologies to do that. And 600, code, 600 lines of code to build this, it isn't that much. Uh, well, yeah, as Sotter mentioned, we built also tools that make it simplified for you to build React Native apps. So we have one for gestures, for animations, for uh, navigation and SVG support. And these tools are downloaded more than 3 million times. Why do I care? Because React Native is huge. Look at those numbers. So many developers use React Native to build production apps. More than like thousands of developers know React Native. So these thousands of de developers build applications for various platforms. Some of these applications are for sure on your mobile phones right now. Uh, Outlook, Facebook, maybe Teslas, if you're lucky. Uh, so wouldn't it be cool to have if React Native supports that many platforms, iOS, Android, it could also support Onira. And these developers could bring those applications to a new platform with them. That would be kind of cool. And we are going to the next section, so bringing React Native for Onira. Passing mic to Julius. Thank you. Uh, so hi, my name is Julius. I'm a software engineer at Software Mansion, currently working on bringing React Native to the Open Harmony operating system and by extension to the Onira ecosystem. Mm, my goal here is to briefly talk about my work and what one needs to do to port React Native, to bring React Native to a new platform. Uh, so maybe without further delay, one can think of a React Native application as being built from three different parts. There is the shared JavaScript code, a shared C++ native layer, and the platform-specific implementations. Uh, the application developer, uh, like Casper mentioned before, writes their application code in JavaScript using the React framework, the APIs provided by the React framework, as well as uh, JavaScript modules provided by React Native, which give uh, the functionalities provided by the platform. 
Uh, then on the platform specific side, what we need to do is take the uh, take the application, the interface of the application that React computes based on the application code and render it on the screen, as well as provide the implementations for any of the native functionalities and provide an entry point for the application, which will initialize the JavaScript runtime, initialize the React Native, uh, the React Native uh, framework on the JS side, and essentially glue all the parts of the implementation together. In between them is the C++ layer, which mostly acts like a glue between JavaScript and the platform-specific implementation written in a platform-specific language like Objective-C on iOS and Java on Android, uh, as well as some uh, React Native core functionalities which do not depend on the platform, such as the Fabric Renderer, which handles all of the non-platform dependent uh, functionalities needed to draw things on the screen. Like Katsper mentioned before, uh, React Native is based on the web framework React. And in React, uh, the job of actually drawing the interface on the screen is done by a part of the implementation called the React DOM renderer. When the React framework runs the React application code, it produces a tree of base components, which in the web case are just the HTML elements, and passes it over to the DOM renderer. The job of the renderer is then to compute the differences between the previous, previously mounted uh, component tree and the one it just received, and uh, apply these differences to the mounted web page using the DOM APIs by updating, adding, and removing the elements mounted on the screen. Uh, with React Native, we do much the same thing, where uh, we uh, use the React framework to compute the tree of the components, the description of the interface, and then pass it over to the Fabric Renderer, which itself is responsible for uh, comparing the previously mounted and the newly com computed tree, calculating the differences, and uh, passing over those differences uh, to, to the platform-specific renderer. Then the platform specific renderer itself is responsible for applying those differences to the to the screen essentially. Uh, and unlike most uh, cross platform UI frameworks such as Flutter or Qt, which use lower level graphical APIs like OpenGL or the Skia Canvas to draw their interfaces, we use uh, we built React Native on top of an already existing native application framework for the platform. So on iOS, that's UIKit. On Android, that's the Android framework. And all of the React views are then mapped onto uh, the views native to that framework, like the text component in React Native being mapped to UI text view on iOS or the text view widget on Android. Uh, with When bringing React Native to Onuro, we do much the same thing, where we use RQI, the native a graphical application framework for Open Harmony as the foundation for our React Native implementation. So, uh, in much the same way as it happens on iOS and Android, we will take that text component created by React and map it over to a RQI text component. Okay, so maybe to see it on an uh, example, we have a very simple React Native application which just renders some text and an image wrapped inside a view container component. Uh, when a React Framework runs this application, it computes a new uh, tree of components with the view at the root and two subtrees containing the text and the image component and passes it over to the Fabric Renderer. Then uh, the Fabric Renderer computes the differences between the previously mounted empty tree and the new application and uh, produces a list of mutations, uh, changes to the component tree that needs to be made. Uh, here we can see uh, that it produces a, a create mutation, creating a new node, a new component node, assigning it some properties, uh, and it connects them using an insert mutation which actually forms the tree. Then the role of the uh, platform-specific renderer is to receive that list of mutations 
and apply it to the displayed native view hierarchy. Uh, in this case, for the, for the view container of the application, we'll create a native RQI stack component, and the subtrees of the stack component will correspond to the text and the image components uh, defined in our React Native application. Then RQI does most of the heavy lifting for us and renders that application to the screen using the same components that it would use if you just written if you had just written the application in RQI yourself. Uh, and yeah, that's essentially what you need to do to render an, a React Native application to the screen. But usually, uh, when you write applications, you don't want to just display something. You also want to handle some user interactions or some other sources of changes which need to be displayed on the screen, such as network events. And uh, in React Native, this is done using a mechanism called well, events. Uh, so say we wanted to write our own button implementation, custom button, which will turn a bit transparent when you start touching the button and run some uh, callback that was provided to it when you stop touching it. Uh, so what will happen in our React Native for Onero implementation when a user touches the view uh, represented, uh, the view making up this button component? Well, as we saw on the previous slide, sorry. Uh, as we saw on the previous slide, uh, the view component is made up of a stack RQI view. On the stack RQI view, we set up a callback uh, for any touches that are made to it, which then uh, emit an event to the React site. The React framework is responsible for then uh, reacting to that uh, emitted event by calling the callback in onTouch start registered in the React Native application, which applies some change to the state of the component. Uh, React is a reactive framework which uh, works which knows that when a state of the component uh, is changed, it needs to re-render by calling the component, uh, the function defining the component again. And as a result, to the, uh, the opacity value passed to the view changes. Fabric then knows that a change to the tree was made, calculates an update mutation, passing the new opacity property back to the native site, and the RQI component gets assigned a new opacity value, which results in a visual change to the opacity of the button. And with these two, uh, these two mechanisms, rendering and emitting updates, you can have interactive applications with, uh, without much work. Uh, so yeah, to reiterate, when you want to port React Native to a new platform, you need to handle uh, initializing React Native with most skipped over that part here. Uh, you need to map React Native's base components, which there aren't a lot of, to the native views of the platform you are targeting. You need to handle the mutations created by the fabric renderer, which just correspond to making changes to the native view hierarchy by inserting, removing, and updating views. You need to uh, pass user interactions back to React, so it can know when to update the, the application <laughs> state. Uh, and lastly, you have to re-implement some of the built-in modules using platform native APIs, uh, which can differ between platforms. And essentially, once all that is done, you can run React Native applications on a new platform. And in, in the picture, you can see uh, the same demo that Kasper shown off before, running on iOS Android, uh, running on a development board, running on Euro. Uh, and the same demo you can check out at our booth just outside the, this hall. And uh, that's it for my part of the presentation. And I think we have some time left for any questions you might have. Yeah, yeah. How do you, you call it? Uh, 
Okay, uh, so the question was uh, that React Native needs to compute the changes between the tree mounted before and uh, after applying some updates, right? And you're asking if it's the same concept as virtual DOM. So I'm not that familiar with the web implementation for React, but I, I believe that it's exactly, uh, exactly the same concept. So in React, you have the React DOM renderer, which plays that part. In here, uh, there is a re-implementation uh, re of the React renderer, uh, which does exactly the same job. It's just written in C++ for portability. On, on Fabric, there is one more tree. It's called Shadow Tree, but it kind of works like uh, yeah. like Virtual DOM for, for native apps. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are really three trees going on there. There is the React component tree, which then gets computed to a Shadow Tree on Fabric, which maps more or less one to one to native components in the native view hierarchy. All right. Uh, yeah, so there are frameworks for testing React applications. So the fact that you can really plug your own uh, like native renderer uh, solution makes it easy to, to test that the uh, UI updates are what you want them to be, right? Uh, so this is not something that we have worked on, but there are existing solutions for testing React and React Native UI applications. Uh, there is also a solution for testing RQA applications, I think, up and running, or at least... I, I don't know the details about that, but there are, there are some testing in that regard as well. Yeah. So you can test both uh, the shared part of this diagram and the RQA applications themselves as well. And Casper might have some more insight into the React site. Yeah, so for JS parts on iOS and Android, you can use Jest to, to test uh, JavaScript parts. And uh, React, React has its own also. Uh, for because it's native, as as the name says, you can use native um, testing frameworks. For example, Appium that was built for uh, iOS and Android, and React Native has its own. For example, Detox. So there are a couple of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, frameworks to test UI, and there are others that like um, encapsulate only the components that you want to test. So yeah. Okay. Sweet to one, no more questions. Okay. Thanks everybody for your time. Thanks for listening in. And I mean, the booth is outside if you want to get more in touch or so and, and talk into details or so. Okay. Thanks.